Can evil reside within an inanimate object? Do things such as guns and swords and other weapons retain the memories, the feelings, the emotions of those who once used them to inflict harm? Interesting concept, isn't it? And one that's central to the theme of tonight's story. Now, this one's pretty, pretty mean, I have to warn you. The protagonist is not someone you'd like to bump into on a cold, wet, rainy night, or at any other point in time, to be honest. But it makes for an intriguing story, I can tell you. So, my dear friends, it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Part 1. Acquisition Greetings and salutations, my dear readers. I suppose you might be wondering from the title why I would be divulging such things to the masses. Well, because if I didn't, what would be the point, right? And besides, in such cases as this, disbelief is a powerful asset. But for the few of you willing to step into the world of the fantastical and listen to my words, I have much to tell. Please excuse the artistic embellishment, but I didn't get where I am today by leaving well enough alone. For starters, I am a craftsman. A bladesmith, to be more specific, and a damn fine one at that. I cater only to those willing to pay top dollar for the very best. This detail is important, as it is key in the focus of what I set out to accomplish, and accomplish it I did. Now. As the title suggested, my goal was to actually create a cursed object. But how to even go about that, and why, you might ask? Well, the simple answer as to how is, by its very nature, not easy. And why? Well, why not? I've never considered myself a nice or even a good person, and don't particularly value human life above any other. I suppose you could say my motivation was that I was faced with a realization that, unlike those at the bottom with nowhere to go but up, I am at the top of my craft and had nowhere to go from there. I needed something that nobody else had ever done. So I began my year of painstaking research. The very first thing I set out to learn was, what is it that makes something cursed or haunted? I came to the conclusion that it was trauma. Now, the nature and degree of the effect seemed to be in correlation to the type of trauma. Determining this was a vital step to my process, as there is a clear difference between a simple haunting and a genuine curse. You see, a haunting is, at its core, the clinging of a spirit or will, or energy or whatever you like to call it, to a place or object, usually through some form of tragic and untimely death. However, a curse is the result of malicious and evil actions, and therefore results in a much more potent connection. In addition, the worse the action, the greater the effect it has on the object. Once I established this, the next step was to identify, locate and procure the various materials I would use in the construction, and not only the raw materials, but the tools as well. As part of my method, I decided that as many of the tools I would use as possible would also need to possess these malevolent histories. I took to the internet and frequented any and every site I could find that focused on violent murders. And not the run-of-the-mill murders either, no sir. I was looking for very specific instances in which some element of the murder was both usable in my project and actually obtainable. It is at this point that I should mention that if you have any inclination to replicate my endeavor, you should be prepared to spend a great deal of money on both travel and procurement of these materials, especially when the situation calls for you to bribe an evidence room guard or two. Their compliance and silence doesn't come cheap and is often the only way to obtain certain items. As I am a bladesmith, the obvious choice for this undertaking was to make the object some kind of large knife or small sword. So the first and most important item on my list was the steel for the blade. If 
Finding a piece of steel with the right composition to make a half-decent cutting tool is easy enough, mind you. However, the difficulty arose in meeting the project-specific qualities I required for this unique piece. But, after much searching, I happened upon a particularly enticing case of a man in the Pacific Northwest who was convicted of multiple homicides and sexual assault charges. The case involves repeated instances of the man luring young women out of the public sight, rendering them unconscious, placing them in his van, then driving them far away to an abandoned lumberyard. It was here that he would assault the women for periods of time, ranging from days to weeks before executing them by placing them on the conveyor feet first, with their legs tied and crossed together, and sending them into the running saw blade. It seems as if he got great satisfaction from watching them shriek and cry as the screaming saw made contact with the bottoms of their feet, then moving up through their cross legs, their torso, and then finally their head. In the end, he was charged and convicted of 11 counts of murder, sexual assault, kidnapping, and various lesser charges. However, after the trial, he confessed to anywhere from 35 to 45 additional counts that remain uncorroborated due to him allegedly disposing of the remains in an industrial wood chipper he kept on the site. The case was perfect, and the location of the sawmill was relatively easy to find. Upon my arrival, I found that the local authorities had sealed off the entrance, but that was a contingency I had planned for, and was able to overcome with the bolt cutters I'd purchased at a small hardware store earlier that day. As I made my way into the mill, I began my search for the saw, admittedly apprehensive that the saw he used might be a bandsaw that would be much less practical for my needs, not to mention considerably harder to move and transport. But after a brief period of searching, ah, there it sat, a beautiful 30-inch circular saw blade. As I drew closer, it became apparent by the deeply stained surroundings of the fixture that this was the blade I was looking for. Reaching into the small tool bag I'd brought from the rented U-Haul truck outside, I made quick work of removing the large disc from its fixture, with the little help of WD-40 to loosen the years of rust that clung to the threads. After rolling the saw blade the short distance back to the truck and loading it into the cargo hold, I began plotting my next acquisition. This would be the remains of a recent homicide by arson, a few states down. This case involved several teenagers burning down another child's home that they'd been bullying after he took refuge from them in his house, after fleeing their attempts at inflicting upon him whatever form of harm they were planning that day. As it turned out, the boy's slightly younger sister was also in the dwelling at the time, and they suffered the same fate together. Awful tragedy for them and their parents. Happy coincidence for me and my little project. I would use the charred remains as the fuel for the fire in which I would forge the blade. This was a relatively unchallenging, albeit tedious and tiresome task, that mostly involved shoveling the blackened wood into burlap sacks and chucking them into the back of the truck. I will admit, even I felt a cold chill run down my back from time to time during this chore. The energy there was still very fresh and strong, which is why I was so intent on harvesting that one in particular. Once I was done, I took to a local diner and began locating my next stop. I would need something for the handle so I looked for murders involving something that could serve such a purpose. I first found one such case where a teenage girl became mentally disturbed and beat the child she had been babysitting to death with a wooden softball bat, then waited for the parents to return and did the same to them. Unfortunately, the murder weapon was never actually recovered. Oh, what a shame, I thought to myself, and went on about my search. About an hour later, I found a case of a man who used an axe handle to kill his wife and the man he caught her having an affair with. However, that didn't seem quite sinister enough, so I searched on until... <gasps> Jackpot. 
I couldn't believe my luck when I stumbled across an article about a case involving a middle-aged woman who had lured several young children into her home, where she then tortured, killed, and butchered them before cooking and eating the remains. To my good fortune, I was able to learn that a local boutique dealing in the macabre had come into possession of the cutting board she had used in the butcherings. Before making the trip to investigate the authenticity of the cutting board, I did some more digging to see if there was any more um, usual memorabilia between my location and the destination. After a few dead ends, I stumbled upon a case of a man murdering his then pregnant wife with a gas-powered nail gun by firing more than a few sixteen-penny nails into her head and face, but not before doing the same to her stomach. Hmm. The nails would make perfect pins for the handle. I spoke quietly to myself, but not quietly enough to keep the man in the booth in front of me from giving me a nosy glance back over his shoulder. And, as luck would have it, the incident took place roughly two-thirds of the way between where I was and where I was headed. The only issue was that, to the best of my knowledge, the nails were still in the possession of the local police department, as the man was still awaiting trial. Obtaining these wouldn't be as simple as the rest, and most assuredly not as cheap. But this wasn't an opportunity I could let pass me by. I departed the following morning, and arrived at my destination some eight or so hours later. The next week was spent figuring out exactly which member of the department would be most susceptible to my bribe. I settled on a middle-aged fellow we'll call Carl. Carl was a police property clerk and had accumulated some hefty gambling debts. After faking a casual conversation when I coincidentally ran into him at a local dive bar, that I then carefully steered toward our jobs in order to cover for my knowledge of his, I lied that I was a building contractor. Then I moved the conversation to our hobbies, which I again lied and told him I liked to collect weird and creepy items. And finally, to our personal problems once his intoxication had reached sufficient levels. Once he mentioned that he had some substantial outstanding debts with some not-so-gentle types, I suggested a possible solution to his tribulations. If you can get me a couple of those murder nails... <clears throat> Here we go. If you can get me a couple of those murder nails out of evidence, I can make all your financial troubles disappear. I offered. And even grease the wheels with a little extra for your efforts and silence. Just for two little nails that nobody would really even miss. One from the woman's head, and one from her stomach. And you're debt free. And even a little richer on top of that. What do you say? I pressured. Oh, dear God, man. Why would anyone in their right mind even want such a thing? He asked in utter revulsion. My business is my own, I answered. I want those two nails, and after that, you'll have your money and I'll be long gone. Last chance. By noon the next day, I had the nails in my hand, still crusted in the dull brown of dried blood. I quickly tucked them away into a small pouch which I'd stashed in the back of the truck with everything else before setting out to my next destination. It's worth mentioning that at this juncture I began to feel a constant sense of unease while in the truck, accompanied by an ever-present sensation of wearing an extremely tight-fitting shirt that made me uncomfortable and somewhat asphyxiated as I drove, even after putting on the loosest clothing I'd packed. I managed to arrive at the boutique just before closing. The shopkeeper welcomed me casually as I passed through the door, causing a small bell to herald my entry. I wasted no time in telling him what I was there for. A grim expression washed over his face, but was in short order replaced by one that seemed to be relief. Twenty bucks and it's yours. That damn thing gives me some serious bad vibes and I want it out of here. Should have never bought the thing. Horrible, that whole ordeal was. This gave me some confidence that it was the genuine article. But I still had to compare it to the crime scene photos just to be sure. He went into the back of the shop and returned soon after, carrying a bundle of scarlet fabric 
which he proceeded to unravel to reveal the deep black ebony cutting board. I thought to myself that a lady with such refined taste would have made a fine customer in another life, and no sooner did the thought enter my brain than the shopkeeper spoke up. I've got a kitchen knife set too, actually, if you want those too. They're actually pretty nice. Curiosity took me, and I said I'd consider it, if only to see what kind of cutlery one who owned such a lovely and expensive cutting board would have. He made his way into the back once more, and retrieved the knife block. Before I could catch myself, I was laughing maniacally in the middle of the shop. Now a look of confusion on the shopkeeper's face. In my search for the cutting board, it never even occurred to me to investigate what other tools the lady might have used in the crimes. But to my great surprise, I immediately recognized the set of knives as my very own work. The coincidence was too much and the laughter erupted out of my control. I knew for a fact she was no customer of mine, so she must have obtained them second-hand from an estate sale or as a gift, but they were definitely and unmistakably of my make. Uh, is, is there a problem? The shopkeeper asked through my laughter. No, no, not at all. Just a very small world we live in, I replied as I calm myself down to a reasonable state. I guess I'll take those off your hands as well, I added. Since I'd got such a good deal on the cutting board, I figured I could buy the knife set off him as a small token of my appreciation. How much? I inquired. Take a hundred for all of them, he answered. An unexpected anger took me as I growled. One hundred dollars? His eyes widened in shock. I'm sorry, mister. I thought that was fair since they're so pretty, but I can go a little lower if you think that's too much. I glared at him for a moment before barking. No, that's fine. Here. Handing him the total for everything. I collected my purchases together and opened the door with a sharp kick, causing the bell to clang in alarm as I looked down at the set of kitchen knives I once charged many thousands of dollars for seething over the thought of them being hocked away for one hundred goddamn dollars at this ratty little hole in the wall junk shop. Once my temper subsided, I got back to my wicked little scavenger hunt. I happened across a two-pound hammer, a man had used to bludgeon his elderly and disabled parents to death with. I would have to repeat the nails con to get my hands on it, but I knew it would be perfect for forging out the blade, so I had to have it. The narrative of obtaining the hammer was, for all intents and purposes, an encore of the acquisition of the nails. Ah, there's always someone who needs money, and they'll always compromise their self for enough of it. At this point, I was beginning to feel physically ill during the time I spent in the truck with the collection of items. So I elected to abandon my previous idea to accumulate any more tools, and to simply use my own instead. I made only one unscheduled stop on my return trip. As I began to make my way back onto the interstate, I was stopped by a red light. It was there, in the dark and early morning hours, that I witnessed from the seat in my rented truck what appeared to be two homeless men struggling against one another beneath an overpass. I sat in morbid fascination for several minutes at the empty intersection watching the two do battle until one seemed to wrap a length of cord around the other's neck and proceeded to strangle the life out of him. Once the commotion died down, I popped the door of the truck open, made my way across the street. The triumphant vagabond jumped, startled by my presence and the realization that I had witnessed the incident. It was, it was self He started, but I cut him off with a gesture of my hand. Reaching down, I untangled the long piece of nylon cord from the dead man's lifeless body. I ran it through my fingers, taking note of the size, thickness and length. Finding this to be an acceptable addition to the final product, which I would wrap around the handle, I rolled it up as I made my way back to the vehicle I would left sitting abandoned at the still desolate traffic light. I opened the back once again, 
and after finding a place for the newest edition, I departed towards my workshop. Part 2. Construction After arriving home, I immediately went straight to bed to rest and recover from the prolonged exposure to the atmosphere of the truck and the items held within. It took me some time to shake the exhaustion, but once I did, it was off to work. I should take this opportunity to clarify that a key component to any real curse is intent. Especially with a project like this, where I use multiple objects formed together into one single product. And by intent, I mean you have to really want to cause as much pain, misery and suffering as possible. This came easy to me, as I hate, oh I hate, I hate people. They disgust me. I find the whole lot of them absolutely abhorrent. I want nothing but the worst to befall any one of them at any time. This malice would be the tether or glue that would hold the malevolent energies to the objects as they are cut and shaped and heated and bent. Well, of course, at the time this was entirely theoretical, mind you. After some contemplation and sketching, I decided I would make something of a short sword in the fashion of the Sumatran adaptation of the Ottoman Yataha. While not overly long, they possessed a wicked curve in the shape of an S. This would make the weapon cut extremely well despite its lack of size and weight. I mean, just because the thing will be cursed doesn't mean it shouldn't also be functional and practical, right? After drawing out the final shape, I took to the shop and began my work. To start, I cut a long section of the circular saw blade I procured from the mill. As I began, I immediately noticed the steel was much more difficult to cut than an average saw blade, wearing down several cutting discs to the rim on a task that would normally not use up even one. <laughs> a fluke, I thought as it could have easily been under-tempered at the factory where it was made, resulting in a much harder steel than normal for such a tool. But it became apparent that this wasn't the case, as I began to forge the rough shape of the blade. The steel would heat much slower than usual, and despite being brought to a bright yellow, took a great deal more force to hammer into shape. It was almost as if the steel was resisting the change to its form I was attempting to impose on it. This I found somewhat frustrating, as I had only a very limited supply of the charred wood from the burned house, so I had to use it sparingly. The anomaly continued, as I ground the bevels and shaped the handle, and even into the quenching process. But the steel slowly gave way to my efforts and took shape. Once the steel component was ready, I began to craft the handle. I retrieved the deep, black, ebony cutting board from the truck, where I'd been keeping the rest of the objects to avoid the negative effects they had on me while driving it. I started by cutting two separate blocks to attach to either side of the tank, the part that extends from blade into the hilt for those of you not in the know. But as I did this, the teeth of the bandsaw almost immediately began to dull and then erode away. Not only that, the wood began to ooze a deep, black, viscous fluid containing swirls of bright crimson red that caused any skin it came into contact with to severely burn and itch. It took some time to clean away the fluid that had become adhered to the table of my saw, but as it was apparent that this wasn't the tool for the job, I took out an oscillating saw and a carbide blade used for cutting things too hard for regular steel saw blades, such as ceramic tiles. Now, with latex medical gloves, I made a second attempt at cutting the sinister material. While time-consuming, my efforts eventually paid off. After wearing down several saw blades and discovering that industrial spill solvent could be used to dilute and clean away the fluid much more easily, I finally had the profile of the handle cut to its rough shape. Following this, I proceeded to drill the holes I'd used to attach the nails which would be used to hold the piece of the cutting board in place. During this process, I used some regular nails of the same size from my shop to avoid any unnecessary exposure to the remaining materials. 
Once the holes were finally drilled through the bleeding wood, I brought in the genuine article. After making sure they were a proper fit, I began to cut them down to the right length to be pinned flush to the rest of the handle. While not as trying as the circular saw blade, the nails were uncooperative in their own way, working much slower than the mild steel they consisted of rightfully should. I can't say for sure, but as I cut the heads off the top of the nails, I thought I could hear the sound of a woman screaming and an infant crying over the metallic whir of the angle grinder. But I half expected to encounter such phenomena going into this endeavour, so it had little effect on my progress. Then began the attaching and shaping of the handle. At this juncture, the time I'd spent around the weapon began to cause me to once again feel the familiar effects from the truck start to take hold. Everything became considerably more laborious and progress slowed, but I persevered and finished the task at hand. Once that was complete, I entered the compartment of the truck one last time to retrieve the cord I'd taken from the homeless man's corpse. Wrapping the handle with the cord was decidedly the easiest part of the entire ordeal, and might have been relaxing if not for the feeling of deathly illness hanging over me at the time. Once that was done, I put the final sharpened edge on and sat back to look at what I had created. This might seem like a pretty quick process because of the writing, but rest assured this took several weeks of work due to the material's unwillingness to cooperate. Part 3. The Test As I sat there in my shop, I noticed something. The sickness I'd felt had lifted, leaving me with an even greater sense of accomplishment and relief. My theory as to why that is, is perhaps, now that it was finished, this thing truly was mine. I'd made it through the arduous trial of bringing the sword into being, and now it, and all the darkness it held, answered to me. The curse was mine. It was definitely a severely cursed object, but what effect would it have on a random person? I thought this to myself thinking of how best to evaluate the properties of something as unprecedented as what was surely the most cursed single object in the entire world. My first test was to remove the blade from the shop and gather the remnants of the items used to create it. I made sure the sword was a significant distance away and then placed the remaining objects in the shop with me. After sitting there for the better part of 30 minutes, I concluded that the entirety, not just part, of the negative energies attached to these various materials had transferred to the sword. This meant the final result was already better than I'd anticipated. It was definitely evil, but just how evil I had to know. For the next test, I made a modest display and mounted it in my living room. I then invited an acquaintance, who we should call Jerry over under the premise of helping me move a couch on account of I'd hurt my back lifting a heavy piece of machinery a few days before. As we entered the living room, he immediately was drawn to the weapon sitting in wait on its stand. He inched carefully towards it with an inquisitive gaze in his eye. As he reached out to touch the hilt, I asked from behind, hmm, like that one, huh? And chuckled as he nearly leapt out of his skin from the scare. Uh, yeah. Just something about it. It looks kind of different from your usual stuff, though, he answered. Mm, just felt like trying something new. Shake things up, you know, I said, attempting to feign friendly conversation. Touch it if you like. He reached out and took hold of the handle, picking it up from its display. Oh, it's really nice, he said after examining it for a few moments. Something about it feels right, right, he continued, his face beginning to turn a pale white and a look of mild nausea washing across it as he added, I, I think I need to lie down. Oh, I don't feel so great. As I reached out to take the blade from his now trembling hand, I told him that 
perhaps it's best if we try to tackle the couch some other time, and that he should probably go home and rest. He agreed and left soon after, apologizing for not being of any help. Little did he know just how helpful he had been. I now knew that the sword possessed some form of hypnotic pull that drew people to it, and the effect it had on them was not only potent, but fast-acting. This only served to further arouse my curiosity. I had to know what the prolonged effects of exposure would be. It was then I had an idea. After a few days, Jerry returned to proceed with the relocation of the couch. After a little work, and a lot of acting to fake the non-existent pain I told him about earlier that week, it was done. Before he left, I handed him a large, flat box containing the sword, and told him that it was a small token of my appreciation, and to open it when he got home. This was partly to test a theory to see if the aluminum foil I'd lined the box with would at least lessen the effects of the object held within. Knowing he had several errands to run before he would return home that day, I hastened to make my way to his empty house, where I proceeded to place small hidden cameras I'd purchased at a local electronic shop the day before all around the domicile. Once I'd finished, I quickly departed before he or his family could return. I made my way back to my house, where I made sure all the camera feeds were up and working properly, then sat and waited patiently for Jerry's return. He walked through the door at about 5.30 that afternoon. His wife and two teenage children had arrived earlier, around 4.25. His wife was in the kitchen, and his oldest son, a son of around 17, was in the living room watching TV, while his youngest, a daughter of around 15, had taken to her room upon entering the home and was doing whatever 15-year-old girls do alone in their rooms. Now, I know what you're probably thinking, and the answer is no. I'm a monster, not a pervert. I watched only enough footage to know their locations at any given time. Jerry was the one I was interested in. I watched as he sat the box down on the table and told his wife about my uncharacteristically generous gift. He opened the box revealing the sword he'd been admiring so fervently the other day. He even smiled as he read the note aloud to his wife which said, Jerry. I know that you've admired my work since as long as we've known each other. I'm also aware that my work is far from cheap and that your family and their financial needs always have to come first. So I hope you will accept this token of gratitude for helping an injured old man in a time of need. Careful, it's very sharp. Over the next few days I watched as he would make time to be alone with the thing sneaking out of bed at night and often retreating to his garage where he would admire and caress the blade in an unlit space. His appearance began to diminish from day to day as well. He went from a healthy, vital man to a man with a visage not too unlike a cancer patient after undergoing months of heavy chemotherapy treatments. I watched in enthrallment as the drama unfolded between him and his wife she seemingly pleaded with him to go to the hospital to find out the cause of his deteriorating health. It also seemed he was keeping some form of journal on his laptop, possibly containing some insight into what he was going through as the effects took hold. Then, things took a rather exciting turn on the fourth night. After sitting alone in the dark garage for the better part of an hour, he lifted up the leg of his shorts and began to make long, wavy cuts up and down his thigh. Blood ran down either side of his bleeding leg and began to pool at his feet. After a few minutes of this, he stood and opened the door connecting the garage to the rest of the house and walked through. I followed him on the cameras as he made his way through the home, leaving one bloody footprint as he waited. After a moment, he arrived at his bedroom door, behind which was his sleeping wife, he slowly opened the door and stepped through. Once inside, he stood in silence at the foot of their bed and watched her sleep for about twenty or so minutes before apparently coming to his senses. Realizing the pain in his leg, he also noticed the source and the mess it had created. 
I could almost see his brain working to come up with a believable lie to explain away the bloodstains all over the floor. I was largely uninterested in the footage that followed for the bulk of the next day, as things didn't seem to pick up until night, when everything was quiet and calm. That evening, I sat down at my computer monitor and began to observe as usual. Things went on as they had the past few nights, up until everyone had fallen asleep. Without warning, Jerry slipped out of bed and went straight for the blade sitting on its display in his office once again shifted in my chair at the sight of the activity. However, this time he did not go to the garage, but instead walked back down the hall and into his son's room, where he stood for only a moment before lifting the blade high above his head and bringing it back down into the middle of his son's face. Then again he raised it, cut down into the now dead body lying in the bed, moving lower and lower down the corpse with each stroke removing arms, spilling intestines, and severing legs as he went. By the time he was done, the bed was covered in the dismembered and almost unrecognizable body of what used to be a teenage boy. The next room he entered was his own, where again his wife slept peacefully, unaware of the carnage unfolding in her own home. This time he did not hesitate in his actions. He did, however, start from the bottom up. The first swing took off both her feet, causing her to awake in pain and terror as the next swing landed near her knees, cutting one completely in half, and the other only the end of the blade made contact, leaving the footless calf dangling from a few uncut muscles and tendons. The next stroke landed on her pelvic region, causing her insides to flood the bed and mix with the blood already soaking into the fabric. The next ring took both her hands and sank into her chest as she held them up in a futile attempt to protect herself from her possessed husband, followed by several more chops to her face that brought silence and stillness back to the room. All except for the daughter, who was woken by the horrific screams of her dying mother. She stood in the doorway, paralyzed by fear at the scene in front of her eyes. A small peep signaled her presence, causing the possessed man, who she only a few hours ago knew as her father, to snap his blood-stained face over his shoulder in her direction. With little time to process the situation, Jerry wheeled around, marching towards her in the most predatory of fashions, before one clean swipe of the razor-sharp instrument caused the two halves of the frightened girl to softly bounce to the side of the doorframe as they fell to the floor. Jerry's next action was to immediately place the tip of the blade to his open eye, before running full speed into the wall at the other end of the long hallway, driving the entire length of the thing through his head. I watched, wide-eyed. One hand, which I hadn't noticed, had risen to cover my mouth that was now hanging open in shock and awe, as he fell to the ground, joining his family in a grim death. I only allowed myself a moment to take everything in, before snapping back to my senses. I snatched up a bag of tools I had ready just in case and made haste to the scene. Getting in was easy. He'd left the door unlocked. I had no need to be quiet, just quick. I gathered every one of the hidden cameras and placed them in my bag before retrieving the murder weapon. It hadn't occurred to me until this point that the murder weapon would still have to be accounted for in the investigation that would follow. I made my way into the garage and removed an old machete he had hanging on the pegboard with the rest of his tools. I groaned as I noticed the edge was far too dull to inflict the wounds that would be found upon closer inspection of the bodies. So I hurriedly snatched up a bastard file and worked the edge into something feasibly sharp enough to cause such damage. As I made my way out of the garage, I glimpsed into the son's room, noticing the first cut had landed dead center on his mouth. Oh, the fucking teeth, I complained to myself. I then slipped into the room to examine the remains just to make sure. 
and I could in fact see tiny fragments of broken teeth strewn under the pillow where his head once rested. God damn it all, I hissed to myself. Taking a screwdriver out of my bag to dent the otherwise pristine edge of the machete before making sure to cover the thing in his blood before doing the same with a wife and other child. I then made my way to Jerry, where I removed my project from his skull before reinserting the machete into the empty cavity. This took a little effort, as the blade of the sword was noticeably narrower than the blade of the machete, but with a hard shove the tip popped out the back of his head and sunk in the rest of the way with no trouble. Taking one last pass to make sure I hadn't forgotten anything, I crept back out into the night and then back to the comfort and safety of my own home. But not before making sure to copy and delete all of his most recent journal entries from his laptop. All in all, I would say that, even as of now, this undertaking has been a huge success, causing noticeable deterioration in health, appearance and mental stability in the first day, and possessing a man to brutally murder his entire family, and then himself by the fifth. Oof. Those are results far past anything I could have hoped for. But I decided to take this even further. As of now, I've put the sword out into circulation, and after getting the idea from Jerry's journal, I've been tracking the sword's progress online. I'll be sure to keep you all updated with the accounts of these incidents caused by my little experiment as I find them, and compile the relevant information. Which shouldn't be too hard as the thing tends to leave a very easy trail to follow, if you know what to look for. Well, until next time, my dear readers. 